Thank you for your time today. Um, it's an exciting topic. Weather is very important for all of us. It makes our conversation every day of what the weather is going to be. Um, I'm going to talk about applications in, in business. So I'm going to quickly go through this slide. We may be wondering who is Palmorex. In Palmorex, probably you all know more on the, as a consumer, you use the weather network app every day for checking weather. We have also lots of other brands. We are in Europe um, as El Tiempo. We are in Latin America as Clima. We also have um, a weather company in the US named Weather Source. So we are the world's third largest weather information provider. And we are rapidly growing the area of applying weather into analytics as well. So first I want you to, to introduce you to the problem um, of you know, does weather really impact business? And this is a very interesting video that one of our clients made as a hurricane came into Florida, what happens to sales of peanut butter? So let's, let's see what happens. As you can see, as the hurricane comes in, the, the various cities are mapped out and you can see the, the shelves emptying out, um, which, is a, which is a good sign of you know, very clear impact of weather, extreme weather on what happens in the market. A more recent one, we've all heard about the smoke and the effects um, last week, and that directly impacts weather. So you can see that you know, a lot of air purifier sales went up as soon as that um, smoke um, alarms were prevalent. <clears throat> So this is an extreme condition, what I'm showing you. But if you take day to day, you know, this, this doesn't often happen day to day. But even day to day, weather really changes, you know, what we buy, um, what products we consume. And, you know, some of this, you know, there is research that shows both from the US and globally that, you know, economic studies have been conducted that really show that weather impacts business. And intuitively, if you look at it, you know, if it's a really warm day in the winter, no one of, none of us are going to be shopping, right? We want to spend that day outside. So it's going to have an impact on retail sales. If it's a really hot and humid day in summer, we probably want to be indoors. So therefore, there's going to be more shopping. So intuitively, we know all of this. And this has impact on three areas of retail. One is, you know, based on this, Staff scheduling is important, particularly in restaurants, <clears throat> in all those food networks where, you know, depending on whether we choose to go out for a restaurant or not. <clears throat> in supply chain planning, like what products to stock up. And finally, into marketing, because marketing is about promoting your goods. And if some goods are not going to sell in certain weather conditions, why would you waste your money on that? So there's a lot of dollars in the business world that is associated really on how com consumers behave in weather. So this is the problem that we took on as a company. And our vision was, can we build an ML platform that is easy enough for customers to bring in their sales data and understand truly, not just the impact of weather, but everything that is local because it's weather is one of the factors, but locally at stores, events affect their sales. The local demographics and economy affects their sales. So can we bring in a platform that both allows to understand the impact of all these factors, as well as predict the demand um, of what the uh, next few weeks is going to be. So we considered a platform that you know we can bring in all sorts of hyper local things from events to um, retail sales to calendar even you know holidays are affecting different stores differently in a area where ethnic demographics is higher Chinese New Year could have a bigger impact on your sales compared to another neighborhood so all of those local nuances hyper local um, is the things that we wanted to bring in 
And then we also, you know, as a platform, wanted to be sure that, you know, we want to supply this to customers. So by bringing in all these hyperlocal models, it should still be, you know, cost effective for us as well as for the customer. And finally, the three outputs we wanted to bring out were one, an easy to understand dashboard that provides the impact of all these local variables on sales. Some customers are more sophisticated, they have their own BI tools, so we want to bring in those into the customer's platform. So the key insights, can we bring it in? And then finally, as um, an action, all insights without action is, is meaningless, so can we actually help them drive ROI by helping to control their marketing spend? So this is the vision of what um, we aspired and what we have built, and today, you know, we have major retailers using it, major restaurants using this platform. And that's the case study I'm going to walk you through of, you know, what is the, what's our learnings behind building such a platform with AI and ML at a hyper-local level. So let's look at the principles of <clears throat> how all of this comes together. The first step is, you know, data preparation where retail sales at a st store product level has to come together with weather. So here is where we excel, we have data going back 20 years that across the globe that provides weather historical data for every point, every grid in the globe. So we are able to automatically map the sales into that historical weather data. So it's historical sales mapped against historical weather data. That's step one. And the same can be applied for a lot of other hyperlocal variables like demographics or events and so on. Step two is, you know, we, as much, as much as we say ML and AI are advanced and, you know, there's lots of models that, that are out in the market, end customers in retail still want to understand very clearly the explainability of AI. So one of the things that we want to explain to them is the true impact of weather. And the way we do that is by looking at a local store product, different seasons, and looking at the average sales in the season versus specific weather conditions, and able to derive the true difference if statistically, if weather changes, what happens to the sales. So not a random correlation, but a true correlation when weather shifts. And that's what, and I'll go into this picture in the next slide, but that's what we call as weather impact uh, on demand. So truly, can you identify the weather's impact on demand? And the same is true with other variables that are at a hyperlocal level. And all of this is the explainability part where we're able to, the, the customers are able to look through this, the planners are able to look through this and understand truly did weather have an impact on my, on my product at a local store level? And then these then lead to the feature engineering that we can take all the parameters at a hyper-local level, which is you know, the, the calendar features, the weather features, the events, all of it, and then model all of them together so that we can predict effectively what's the demand going to be. So this is our methodology of how we approach this. And I want to talk about um, you know, an important part is how to explain the impact of weather. And this map is interesting. Um, you see a lot of dots on this map. Each dot is a store and a product. So a specific product at a specific store, but one which has had impact from weather. But what you see here is there are different colors. So if you see towards the north, the colors are darker and there is yellow and green towards the south. It's the same product, but the sales impact varies at different temperatures across all these stores. So what it really tells us is what cold is felt in Florida is different from what cold is felt as in Minnesota. So Minnesota, the product sells when the temperature is much colder compared to Florida where the temperature is much, so even weather is very relative. That's the point I'm making that it's not just about, oh, there is a correlation with temperature, 
it's really at what level people feel relative cold or relative snow is going to impact. And that's the reason why hyperlocal explanation definitely adds a lot of value. The other thing we have all seen is, you know, it's not just what happens today in weather that's impacting us. We make decisions even before. If two days from now, it's going to be extremely hot, or two days from now, there's going to be an extreme snowstorm, as consumers, we make decisions around that. And that's another element that we wanted to bring in into the platform as well, which is sort of panic buying behavior. So what's the impact not on a day when there is a weather event, but the weather forecasted that's going to arrive two days from now. So that's something that we studied as well. The same thing is true even in the features of, you know, it's not cold happening that's just going to impact the sales. It's cold happening for the first time in the season. So right now, it's a little bit warm, but this week is a little bit cooler. Therefore, our behavior changes again. So the change in terms of events, whether it's hot or cold or snowfall or rain, happening at different orders in the season, also has different impacts on, on the sales. So we wanted to bring not just the correlation with weather, but also the correlation with the order of the events and the days before the weather hits. And then finally, you know, one of the biggest uh, things in modeling that's affecting everybody is how do we manage the COVID years? Because if you have a retailer and you have years of data, then there are years where there was a distinct change in customer behavior because of COVID, right? But now we are post pandemic, uh, but still some of the behaviors of the customers have completely changed because of the pandemic. How do we model that out? And how do we take the impact of weather from there? So we are considering that too, uh, particularly because we are taking, you know, I showed you in the previous slide, we are taking the difference from a seasonal average. Because we are taking a dis difference from the seasonal average, in terms of weather, we are considering a delta, so we include the COVID years as well. But when we come to normal forecasting, we mainly look at the post-pandemic. And this is an example of you know, real data compared to our, our prediction as well. So those are some of the principles behind how we modeled out, you know, bringing in weather data and understanding impact of retail. Uh, the next few slides, I want to go into the case study of how do we actually develop a product, you know, using um, scalable um, AI at scale. So this is a good picture from Google. This is a, uh, this identifies the entire machine learning cycle. So many of you probably are familiar with this. The first step is, you know, mainly discovery, identifying the right models, and once you go past that phase and there's an actual value of the machine learning, then it goes into a much more development phase where we talk about how do we take the various features, how do we uh, build pipelines and build the models and evaluate them that they actually solve your problem. And then once you pass that phase, then you move, move into the deployment phase where it's about how do we take all this and productionize this, plan for the deployment. And then finally, once the models are in production, then you have to operationalize it, you have to monitor it with the real world and fine tune it. So if you take the same picture and apply it for, you know, the use case I just talked about, our first Part of it was, you know, mainly the discovery with the retailers is to bring in the sales and the weather correlations and local correlations and see is there enough data here, is there enough correlations here that we want to build this. But once we see the value, then this is where we look at, you know, is there true differentiation when you apply weather and other local variables to the retail product and um, store level sales. And then we look at various different models. Because our models are hyper-local, we really go down to a store product level. We are agnostic about the models. We use off-the-shelf models, but those which actually deliver value to the particular use case. And those hyper-local models, then we evaluate 
see the results, and then finally, in terms of deployment, this is where the, the biggest challenges that I think we solve is since we have hyperlocal models, for example, if you have few thousand stores and few hundred products, your models can run into millions. So we really have to train models at scale and we have to operationalize them. And then we get weather forecasts you know, continuously, so we have to enable those into those models to predict the, the sales forecast as well, and then fine tune from the real world as new sales information comes in, how do we take that and operate and modify the models as well. So that is our cycle in terms of the weather-driven demand, how we have operationalized it. So, so far we talked about how the entire system works, but when you go at scale, you know, this is a good picture um, that identifies what happens when a system, complete system goes into production. The main thing I want you to note is the ML part becomes much smaller into the whole cycle. So you have to deal with a lot more in terms of, you know, how do we collect and verify data automated, which is bringing in sales and uh, weather data for us. How do we extract the features, the right features at the hyper-local level, which is all the analysis tools I talked about. And then once you have identified the right features and have the models, how do you scale it using different tools, uh, different technologies? How do you manage that part and how do you serve it at scale? And finally, when you go, when your things are in production, how do you monitor it and make sure there is a good feedback loop that's flowing in as well? So a large part of you know, um, machine learning used to be about just defining and identifying and solving for the right model. But once you go at scale and productionize it, there's a lot more challenges that you have to deal with that happens at a data engineering level. So what we learned is you know, when you go at that scale, it's data science at scale. So you have to do a lot of pipelines. You have to deal with a lot of infrastructure and costs. So for example, since we are hyper-local, we would have to look at uh, you know, parameter tuning of the same model at different hyperlocal levels, or even identifying different models at hyperlocal levels, and all of this have to be automated. It's impossible to manually take all of this at different store product combinations and identify these things. So these are where pipelines come in, all of this automation, so that we can identify the right set of hyperlocal models and the parameter tuning for each store product. And a lot of this involves, you know, um, computing in the cloud, spinning up instances, and containing the costs, as well as a lot of automation. And what we see is a shift in roles from a data scientist being just involved in ML and modeling to having to understand the breadth of not only modeling, but also data engineering, and able to um, cross the bridge between both doing things at a um, individual model level, but also expanding across you know, an entire infrastructure level. And we are seeing this, there's a lot of new roles that are forming in the industry called the full stack data scientists, where who can go you know, across the breadth of not only modeling, but also across the breadth of data engineering, cloud, and infrastructure. And that's what we saw as well. And I talked about pipelines. So just a simple example, pipelines allow us to automate, in, in our case, you know, bringing in weather and sales data, identifying the features, training various different models at hyperlocal level, validating them, and then picking and, and publishing those models. So this is the, the general um, paradigm. Here I'm kind of applying it to you know, our own weather-driven demand. Um, so again, bringing in sales and weather data, preparing those dimensions, identifying the, the statistics, training the models, and identifying the best scored ones and moving them into production. All of this automation is 
key for us to bring this product to life. Um, and then when you go at scale, you know, there's several levels of maturity you can have. Again, in our case, the, the model actually becomes the lowest common denominator because really we have to operate at store product level, which means it's not possible to just build and deploy manually all these things because you're talking about millions of models. So we have to automate the training phase, automate the validation and deployment, and have different models pushed, pushed into production. So there's a level of maturity where different companies are. And there's also another interesting paradigm about this is you know, those who have worked in software engineering know about CI, CD pipelines, which is continuous integration and continuous delivery. So this is about as you build code, you know, you aut it automatically gets checked in, it automatically runs a bunch of automated tests, so the software quality is improved. The same paradigm is, is moved into, you know, um, AI at scale is continuous training as well, which is as you bring in models, you, you monitor them, you measure their impact with real world signals, and then where there is impact, you retrain them and go through the whole cycle. So automate the, the whole thing as well. And then lastly, you know, cost is a big thing. Um, running AI models at, at scale is going to cost, you know, both on-prem and, and cloud. So we looked at different um, options. So our challenge was, you know, we have to run at scale, hyperlocal models at store product. So you can see the, the equation, which is as we scale more customers, more stores, more products, we have a huge number of models. So there are several open source and proprietary solutions to this. So there is this technology called Ray, which we evaluated, uh, which is really distributed computing for modeling. So it allows you to take different models push it through a distributed computing paradigm, spin up instances, and train all of them in parallel instead of doing sequentially. And again, in our case, each of these models have different hyperlocal dimensions. Therefore, this is a good application. But there's also you know, proprietary tools like Google has tools like Dataflow and Cloudflow, which allows you, again, to spin up instances run different models at scale, and then, you know, again, use metadata stores to store the information as well. And we compared both of them. Um, we, we are heavily Google. We found more optimization with, with Google, and that's where we are. But again, my point here is there's a lot of options when you are doing at scale in terms of both on-prem and cloud of using distributed computing to scale your models. And one interesting thing we found in that is, you know, as you, if you're training hundreds of thousands of models, the main thing you want to spend time, the computer CPU time, is in training the model, not spend all the time in, you know, initializing your systems. And this is where we found, at least for our use case, how we decided between Google and, and Ray is, in, when we applied Ray for distributed computing for our models, there was a lot of time spent in initialization versus the training. Whereas in Google, you can see on the top graph, we had to initialize once, and then all the time was spent in training the models. So the CPU utilization was much more effective for us. Again, this is for our use case, because our models were rather simple. Um, the more important thing were, was uh, for us was to parameterize the hypertuning. Whereas for other models, um, Ray may be a, a useful option as well. The, the other key one is once the models go into production, then you're going to have new data that's coming back. So for us, you know, it's retail sales we are predicting, but new data is coming back as our models go into production of what the actual sales is. And you could have multiple types of um, variations. One is something changed externally that the model hadn't taken into account. So you're going to see data drift that you have to retrain the models. In some cases, the model may be predicting well, but you know, quality drops because again, there is some change in the life conditions. 
again, all of this we will have to take into account, uh, automatically trigger the retraining of the models or, you know, at least monitor it so that we identify the right conditions and, and what to do. Same thing as you have models at high scale, you need to have registries to store them and there's lots of new technologies evolving in, in that angle as well. So <clears throat> I talked a lot, but in summary, the, the main thing I want to leave you with is, you know, modeling is becoming more and more complex. We have lots of complex models, but primarily in, if you had this conference two years ago, this is what a lot of the talk would have been about, which is about how do you bring in data? How do we model effectively? What's the right algorithm? How do you identify the, the KPI of the model? And how do you choose the right model? In the last two years, a lot of things have shifted to as more and more models move into production and lots of real data is coming back. A lot of the shift has moved into how do you automate these pipelines? How do we do this with very less manual intervention? And I talked about the full stack data science. How does the data scientist bridge both roles effectively? Because it's not just about training or identifying the model. It's really about putting it into cost effective production. And then finally, as data comes back from the business world of your existing models, how do you derive continuous improvement? How do you derive continuous business value? These are the new areas that everything is shifting towards. And you know, in this conference, LLM I know is the, is the new darling that everyone talks about. So where do we go from here? We think about, you know, I talked to you about what we have today. Um, where do we go from here in just our world? We are looking at it this way is <clears throat> currently we do provide insights and predictions correlating weather to sales, but all of that is through a dashboard. Where all customers want to go to is just ask a question. They just want to know what's going to be the impact of precipitation in this product for this store next week. So that's where a lot of LLMs come into place because they already solved that problem. But in addition, we have a ton of proprietary data from which we are deriving these insights. So how do we connect a customer's question with the data that we have combined with the power of an LLM so that we can answer that in natural language, I think is, is an important area that we want to head towards, as well as not only answer it, but also action on it by providing the output in terms of an email or anything that is, doesn't require the user to come to a dashboard, but it's, it's driven to them. I hope that case study was useful to all of you. Thank you.